Welcome everyone. Uh, this presentation is for lab safety orientation and training and it's for both facilities, the ERC clean room and the new OCMI facility. So once you have access, you have access to both. Um, I did my best to merge as much of the old presentation to be relevant to the new facility, um, but nonetheless uh, there's a lot of commonalities. Uh, first of all, you guys all know how to dial 911 for emergency. Okay, good. When the first responders get there, they will ask you, uh, who is your emergency contact? There it is. It's Professor Ian Popowski. He's got a phone number. You guys don't have to call it. They'll call if they need to have him down there. Okay? All right, so we're going to cover some general rules, uh, chemical hygiene, uh, the garments that are worn in the laboratory, uh, equipment safety, uh, training protocols, policies regarding chemical and consumables, uh, space allocation, and of course uh, violation procedures. All right, if you haven't done so already, I need you guys to go to this website. Uh, there you will get certification for EPA hazardous waste and OSHA hazard communication. I also recommend that you take the advanced laboratory safety uh, training as well. Uh, you can never get too much training on safety. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yes. If you have an M number, yeah. you will be able to access this. If they don't find your M number in the database, uh, a pop-up will take place, and you fill it out. And of course, then they include you in the database and check again a couple of days later. I believe there is a phone number. If there's any issue beyond that, you can also talk to me. Okay. These are common sense rules. They do apply to the facility. Um, if you make a mess, clean it up. If you find somebody else's mess, it'd probably be in your best interest to clean that up before you start your work. Um, if it belongs to someone else, get permission to use it. Uh, you'd be surprised how many people will borrow your things while you're in the clean room or at the other facility. Uh, if you value it, take care of it. There are a lot of very expensive, sophisticated pieces of equipment in both facilities. And if it's working today, it's because everybody before you has done a good job taking care of it. Okay. Get training. Um, this is mostly with regard to our equipment training protocol. Um, even if you know how to use that tool, you've used it in someone else's lab. For example, uh, there is a uh, laser cutter. Uh, Professor Heikenfeld has one in his lab. Um, you are still required to get signed off on the one that's at the OCMI facility. Okay. If it breaks, report it. This is really important. There's usually long intervals between use. If someone uh, finds a problem but doesn't report it, there's that long period where nothing's done about it until the next person figures out, hey, something's wrong, and they report it. Um, let us use that time wisely so that we can respond to any issue with the equipment and get it fixed as soon as possible. Um, we don't make these rules, uh, but I can assure you that each and every one of these has been violated at one time or another. Uh, do not wear the garments outside the clean room. No food or drinks in the laboratory. Uh, don't open the service doors. Um, we will get a tour after this presentation. I'll show you what I'm talking about if there's any questions about the facility. There's only one service door at the OCMI facility and uh, don't, don't use that door to, with, for anything except maybe passing equipment, okay? Uh, most times it's myself and, and Ron that take care of that. Um, do not work alone. I think if you go to any university that has a central facility for doing this kind of work, uh, they have a buddy system in place. Um, if you can, try and work in the normal uh, 9 to 5 or 8 to 5 hours. Just work during the day when we're on, on call. And uh, if not, bring somebody with you as a visitor. Somebody that can observe, uh, that can be there. If anything goes wrong, they're there to assist. Um, if that's not possible, if you're the only person um, establish communication to somebody on the outside. 
This means using a phone. We have laboratory phones. You call out. You let them know, hey, I'm in this laboratory. If they don't know where you are, make sure they know where you are. And then, of course, if you don't call back, if you, don't, you, know, if you say, I'm going to be uh, in here for a half hour, I'll give you a call and let you know if I need more time. If they don't hear from you, they're supposed to come get you or dial 911 to go find out what happened. Okay, so hopefully you won't forget to call your friend that's uh, waiting for word. Um, let's see. The uh, lab hours, it's worth mentioning, is from 6 in the morning to 11 at night, okay? More than enough time to get your work done, especially if you think about dedicating all your time in lab from 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. Um, if you try to log out after 11 p.m., you can't log out. Or if you try to get back in to, you know, close a process, you won't be able to get back in once, once the clock rolls 11 p.m. It's, it's shut down, okay? Um, do not operate equipment for purposes other than specified. We do have a lot of equipment that is designed for one purpose only or one specific use. Do you have a question? Oh, sorry. Um, this has to do with uh, the versatility of the tools. You, you guys are ingenious. You're creative. You find new ways to use the equipment. I understand that. Um, what we'd ask is that you talk to us first, and then we can, of course, uh, accommodate you and, and find ways for you to do what you need to do. But, um, for example, um, if you have an anodic bonder, which is primarily for silicon and uh, uh, glass substrate bonding, um, you could use it as a hot embossing tool, but, but you know, let us know. Otherwise, we get. Uh, issues with the uh, heated substrates and so on, okay? Um, do not leave work in progress unattended. Uh, there's two situations where this is most important. The first is we have a lot of new automated tools. You want to stick around long enough to make sure that the process is initiated properly. Um, if you have a vacuum system and you don't give it enough time to pump down to, say, a certain set point, uh, it may never get there and it won't initiate your process and it will be hard on the system. So you need to be there long enough to say, yeah, the automation is working as it should. I can leave now. I'll come back in a couple hours to check up on it. Uh, another instance would be where there is no automation. It's relying entirely upon your supervision and you walk away and, for example, uh, you're curing polyimide in the, in the uh, Exhaust is, is leaving the furnace and of course as soon as it hits the oxygen environment it starts to smoke. It trips an alarm. Fire trucks come. You're not there. They're wondering where you are and they're, they're calling everybody to get a hold of you. Okay. Um, you must wear gloves, safety glasses at all times. Uh, we enforce this to the letter. You, you, when you're inside you need to have these uh, at least the gloves and safety glasses. Uh, however, don't wear these outside the lab. Uh, you will be ostracized for wearing gloves and touching doorknobs and things like that. People assume they're contaminated. Uh, take them off. Okay. Uh, accidents or injuries must be reported. This is the university policy. Uh, these things are followed through with EH&S. Uh, our health and safety want to know what happened and of course they want to see if there's anything that could have been done to prevent it. Uh, it's to your benefit to have that on record. Um, don't bring wet samples to dry work areas. So we have a, in both laboratories, we have a clear distinction of where wet work is done and where dry work is done. Uh, to simplify it, I'll just say that wherever there is a, a white polypropylene workstation, you are allowed to do wet work there. Another example would be the uh, fume exhausted workstations, and, and that's it. Um, nothing outside of those areas can properly contain a spill. Um, they're not fume exhausted. This does, you know, in other words, you're not protected if you're doing chemistry outside these uh, work areas. Okay? And then on the other side, uh, if you're bringing wet work to, say, a microscope, um, you, you could be etching the, the microscope objectives, uh, leaving uh, acids, etchings uh, on the surfaces. It's just not safe. Um, 
do not handle equipment with contaminated gloves. Um, so if your gloves are dirty, they got resist or they got chemical, just change them out. Um, consider the supply of gloves unlimited. If anything happens to the glove where it's contaminated or broken, you just get another one. Got a lot to cover on chemical hygiene. First of all, uh, we have uh, limited storage. I mean, acid cabinet bases and solvents are in another, and that's about it. For the OCMI facility, it's even more strict. I think the most that we can carry is uh, chemicals for lithography. No acid work is to be done up there, no base work. Um, okay, and let's see. Of course, you want to wear your personal protection equipment. That would include an apron, a face shield, and extended gloves when you're working at the wet station. Um, always add acid to water. Do not mix acids with bases. And of course, mix acids with peroxides with caution. The reason we included that one is there's some people who are enthusiastic about Piranha Etch, which is a sulfuric acid hydrogen peroxide mix. Um, when you do that, it's, it's uh, very active. It's thermal uh, or exothermic, so be careful. Okay, uh, cleaning. If you spill any chemical, use the chemical spill kit provided. I will show you guys where that is in the facility. Um, of course, you will have the PPE on, uh, which would include a half mask respirator because in a chemical spill, it's no longer in a fume exhausted area. So um, I'd also like to add that as far as cleaning up, it's an option. Uh, you can alert others in the lab that there is a spill and then you can come get us and we can make a determination as to what equipment is required to clean it up. The uh, PPE may not, may not be enough. Um, the uh, kit, of course, is, you know, everything is contained in a small box. If somebody uses the supply, we need to know about it so that we can maintain uh, adequate supply of, of neutralizers and absorbents. Um, rinse your gloves thoroughly in the glove washer provided. So our, our workstations have a glove wash. You, you simply drop your hand inside the well and push on a paddle and it will rinse the back and front of your, your hand and glove and, and clean. Um, let's see, rinse and dry and put away your labware. Uh, of course, any labware left unattended is reclaimed. Uh, photoresist must be cleaned from the work areas. Um, do this early, in the early stages because once it's cured, once all the solvent is left, it takes three times the effort to, to clean it. Um, <coughs> pour waste into chemical, excuse me, yeah, pour waste chemical into designated waste bottles. I, I will show you in a slide next that um, helps determine where these things go. Um, return waste bottles to proper storage cabinet. These, this is one example of the waste bottle that we're using currently. Um, if you'll notice, the, the labeling or the identification of what waste goes into it is on top. And of course, it's a spring-loaded cap. So if it ever evolves hydrogen or pressurizes, uh, it can release that pressure. Okay. If there are no available waste bottles, then contact the staff engineer. Basically, we want to make absolutely certain that what goes into the waste bottle is designated and we're not mixing anything. So the exception, of course, is the non-chlorinated solvents. So you are allowed to mix the IPA, the methanol, and the acetone together. Everything else has a unique designation. Um, chemical waste is stored at the bottom of the cabinet and it's removed un until it's removed from the clean room. All waste bottles must maintain an accurate description of the content. 
Um, is, the garment is, um, I guess you could say there's two different protocols here. One's a little more stringent than the other. Uh, for the ERC clean room, which has class 10, class 1000, class 100 clean room space, you are required to wear a coverall, boots, hood, and a tricot. For the clean room space up in OCMI, uh, currently we only require the gloves, a jacket or lab coat, and shoe cover. And of course these are clean on a two-week cycle. Uh, training protocol, <clears throat> there is a form online, you fill that out, you get it signed by your advisor, and then we schedule training. I do need to make you aware of some of the hazards regarding uh, some of the tools that we have. Um, our aligners, which are, there's several of them, and I will point these out to you. There's, there's an EVG620 that you guys will use, and there's also the Solitec IR3000. Uh, both of these have ultraviolet light. Uh, there's also the electron beam evaporators. Uh, there's two of those, uh, Temescal and Vico. Um, and those generally carry lethal power and um, we also have several uh, plasma tools which can carry some very toxic uh, exhaust or pro I guess you could say um, um, I'm missing the word here it has to do with gases not used that are in the exhaust stream um, and of course some laser equipment <coughs> There are, of course, uh, strong violet, ultraviolet light that can damage your eyes and skin. Uh, common sense, you know, don't look into the light. Uh, the mercury vapor lamp can explode. I haven't actually seen this happen uh, for as long as I've been here. Uh, it requires the lamp at 350 watt to be overdriven, you know, way beyond 400 watt. And the new, new lamp power supplies are intelligent enough to not overdrive the lamp. It's actually the older power supplies that I think you can push the limit and actually cause the lamp to, to blow up. In that case, of course, the mercury vapor has been released and you need to leave the room. Uh, so in the unlikelihood that it happens, just exit the room, okay? Electron beam evaporators. Um, when the gun is on, of course, there's a lethal voltage, or excuse me, lethal electrical power present. Um, we also monitor the tools for x-ray. <coughs> uh, Ron, have they ever picked up x-ray on these machines? Okay. Um, there's always an operator in front of these tools when the gun is on. It's highly unlikely you'll ever come across the power, but it is there. And of course the plasma processors um, will have harmful gases, CF4, SF6, and boron trichloride. Uh, the fluorinated gases are not toxic until, of course, they're cracked by the plasma. Then they become a very strong ion looking for water to combine with and create hydrofluoric acid. And you don't want to come and you don't want to be breathing that. Um, the thing is, is we've got all kinds of interlocks and uh, measures that keep these things away from the operator. For example, the gas lines are leak checked. Um, the uh, process gases are diluted after they've left the chamber. Uh, you couldn't possibly open the chamber while it's under partial pressure. Um, and even when you do open the chamber, it has already been evacuated and backfilled with nitrogen. So it's highly unlikely that you'll be exposed to these. And of course, laser equipment. Uh, we only have a few tools using laser. There is, the la of course, the laser cutter, um, which uses CO2, uh, infrared. I don't see an issue there. It, these are more for the uh, higher frequency uh, ultraviolet. Um, your safety glasses do have some UV block capability. 
but it's, it's the same thing. Use common sense. Don't be staring into the laser light. Um, we do provide some chemicals and consumables. Um, if you don't see it on this list, uh, you have to get approval to bring it in. We need to know about what you're doing with it, and of course uh, we need the material safety data sheet so that we know how to handle it. Um, so, as I said before, if, you, if we don't have it, you need approval to bring it in. And uh, any secondary containers that you generate should have your name, the date that it was generated, and uh, of course the content, and then uh, uh, some kind of contact information, phone or email or both. We need to be able to get a hold of you, okay? We also provide some consumables such as wipes, gloves, disposable pipettes, swabs, uh, solvent bottles, uh, the PPE, which includes the chemical gloves, face shield, and apron. Um, we do have a supply of glass beakers, plastic beakers, graduated cylinders, et cetera, et cetera, if you need any. Um, storage, I will show you in the tour where uh, your toolbox can be stored. Um, any other requests for space, you need to let us know and we can provide that for you as well. Uh, of course, let's see. When a violation of clean room policy is discovered by staff engineer, and we have our ways, uh, a written warning will be issued to the student and copy to their advisor. This warning will be accompanied by retraining. Most of our communication is verbal. Most people correct themselves uh, early on. It's not just to protect you, but it's to protect other, you know, you from other people. Um, and of course, if we can't resolve it, then it, it goes, goes on to, you know, retraining, suspension of privileges, and so on. It's never gone that far. Okay, and that's it. Any questions thus far? None whatsoever. Exploding lamps, so sulfur hexafluoride. Um, you know people inhale sulfur hexafluoride in YouTube videos so that they can lower their voice. It's such a heavy gas you actually have to invert yourself to, to empty it. But uh, I wouldn't want to breathe it after it's been through a processor. Um, that's it. <laughs>